We are the Catalan independentist resistance, and you are listening to a new update from Radio Hadrian in Free Catalonia. Forgiving is not for the weak. It belongs to the powerful ones. Mahatma Gandhi. Um, good afternoon. This is David Rabantos. This is chapter 74 in Radio Adrian here in K Radio. Thanks to Cheryl Scott and Delia Forrest. Um, last week has been intense for the Catalan resistance, but mainly preparing for next week where we're going to have our third conference live and where we're going to have our direct. If any of you be understands Catalan, we do live programs uh, 20 to 22 Catalan time. That's one hour earlier in Scotland. And uh, we keep encouraging you to spread these programs because that's the only way to know about what really is going on in Catalonia and some other things. This week, uh, well, we want to talk about forgiveness, but this program is dedicated to Agustin Roig Morera, which is a member of Director 68, who used to tell me to take my medication and to tell me I was not right. And today he is a dedicated member of the Catalan resistance. This is a process that millions of Scots and millions of Catalans will have to undergo as soon as possible. We have been taken for the biggest ride of our lives, both in Scotland, in Catalonia, but also in Basque Country, in Quebec, in Ireland. They were in Argentina in a different way. We'll talk about it today. Uh, they're going to be, or they're being taken for a ride in New Caledonia as, as you listen to this. So it's a worldwide pattern. And um, so, as Gandhi said as well, be the change that you want to see in the world. So, Agosti encapsulates what I'm sure millions of Scots and Catalans will do in the next month, which is accepting the tremendous uh, farce that both the Catalan and Scottish uh, processes are. And then we're going to take independence in our hands and declare you the I, because... Because that's the only way to independence. And anybody who talks about referendum doesn't want independence. No matter if it's summoned or sturgeon. Only UDI will bring independence. So anybody who talks about referendum is either a liar or has been lied to. I talk about forgiveness because there's going to be a moment. Well, you that are supporting the SNP or people supporting Catalan parties will have to forgive us in a way for what we've said, because we have been saying nothing but the truth for five years now. And we have to forgive them for not being very conscious of how things are going. And then we'll have to both uh, forgive a lot of people who belongs to this system. And then we'll have to judge a few people in Scotland against Alex Salmon, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, relevant members of the national, relevant members of the media there. Everybody who belongs to this system, this system is based on both sides work together against independence in Catalonia and Scotland. So uh, there needs to emerge a resistance, which is not around the SNP, not around the national, not around the means of Scotland, not around Bella Caledonia, not around nothing you love. Because everything you love is run by your enemy. So, um, but forgiveness will have to call. I um, look forward for Catalonia and Scotland more like the Commission for Reconciliation in South Africa brought about by uh, Mandela, the, not the Nuremberg court trials after Nazi Germany lost Second World War. Did they? Um, this week, I want to briefly talk about Nicola Sturgeon. So we start with Scotland. Then we go to Catalonia. Then we go to um, Argentina, in a way, or, or before that we do New Caledonia and then we go a bit worldwide, which is uh, trying to, to fight for the rights of children everywhere in the world. Uh, not so many things have reached me. It's very, we're very dedicated in making Catalonia independent soon. So, uh, because we insist, we think that's the best way we can help. 
Scotland. If we bring about independence in Catalonia and by by showing up how Catalan leaders have betrayed us, that's the best thing we can do for Scotland. Then it would be up to the Scottish women and men to take future in your own hands. So uh, this week I'll start briefly with Nicola Sturgeon. The last few days there's been two things for me about Sturgeon, which is one is going to Auschwitz, you know, and the other is her making speech, calling herself Scotland's corporate mummy or something. Uh, while I was uh, preparing this program, I felt like, what are you going to say about both of these issues? And I think commenting on the Auschwitz visit and commenting on the her calling herself Scottish number one mummy or corporate mummy or something, these are not either flops or no nothing. These are things to keep us busy and to keep us not focusing on what we should be focusing. So I uh, decline commenting on Auschwitz or corporate mummy Nicola Sturgeon because that's the things the system wants us to talk about. What's relevant about Nicola Sturgeon is that she signed the Edinburgh Agreement which was full of loopholes which made possible the Scottish referendum happening in 2014 which she not presided but she was very high up there and she let it happen and she didn't investigate it and she let out a majority of 56 out of 59 Scottish members in Westminster fade away without declaring independence and the same thing happened to the overall majority in Holyrood and as far as I know she keeps being member of the Privy Council of the Queen of England this I think is a mount to treason and that's the only thing people should be talking about but of course as the system has put us into this it has to be Celtic Rangers choice kind of or I guess if any are in hearts if you happen to be in Edinburgh or don't be too harsh on me because I don't know all the teams in in Scotland but um, they made us have to choose between two sides and when they do that we've lost because when they force you to choose between A and B the right answer for the people is possibly C or D or double J Nicola Sturgeon is not a solution to Scotland independence she is the main part of the problem and until people are strong enough to face this trauma and get over it independence of Scotland is impossible and um, and that's it if you go to a second referendum you're gonna be smashed the same way as there's gonna be a second referendum on Brexit which is gonna mean stay and then the reason for a second referendum as uh, the SNP has viciously linked Brexit to independence of Scotland when they should have nothing to do one with the other then the door will be open to um, to not the second referendum which would be a bad choice anyways because only UDI will set you free so that's what I wanted to say about Scotland so I'm not focusing on the minor details the system wants us to focus like Auschwitz or corporate mummies but the referendum and the not declaring independence once you had a majority of both in Westminster and in uh, Holyrood to declare it. Coming back to Catalonia, the farce goes on. We're happy because Director 68 is growing in support and uh, social media and doing live acts and this thing. So it's inevitable that we're going to bring down the Catalan fake in the movement to declare independence. This week, the thing is because um, um, Spanish uh, attorneys, district, uh, well, you know, the lawyers are asking for 25 to 11 years to a lot of members of uh, Catalan Parliament, police, and so on. And now there's a big rage in the fake pro independence movement. And I call it fake because the whole thing with people in prison is fake. We said it already in chapter 19, which I think was only in Catalan, it was a very difficult day, that Spain was going to put the traitors that didn't declare independence. That's a very important point that possibly doesn't reach many places outside Catalonia. Nothing was declared one year ago, and the referendum was made never to be 
acted upon. So what we're leading in Catalonia is a tremendous force to murder independence. We had 42 points lead in November 2013. We should have been independent by 2013 already. 2010, 2011, if you ask me, because here in Catalonia we had non-binding uh, uh, referendums in every city almost, including Barcelona, from 2009 to 2011. So 2011 should have marked the year of the independence. But of course, our political parties and leaders work against independence because they are wearing the Spanish uh, cassock under the Catalan one. And they've been postponing things and delaying things and murdering things. And when they did a fake declaration of independence the 27th of, um, of October last year, we said from Radio Adrian 19 in, uh, in Catalan, now they're going to put the fake the fake independence is the traitors. They're going to put them in prison to make them heroes. And that's what's been going on here with the whole frenzy of yellow ribbons and all this stuff. We've been betrayed by our own side. But to protect the traitors, Spain has to pretend that they are, that Spain is attacking them. That doesn't require a lot of intelligence, but requires a lot of backbone requires character and after 300 years of genocide and the Spanish thump we have lost most of our best elements so not a lot of natural leaders left out there and this program is addressed to those natural leaders out there and um, so that's why we from Director 68 from Radio Adrian we're not joining in our own audition shenanigans about these people, we said they were going to betray us. I made a hunger strike in 2016 for Scotland in Catalonia, saying that we run by traders in both countries. And two years on, and none of our countries is independent. Hmm? Surprise, surprise. And so the ex-president of Basque Country visiting Puigdemont in Brussels, and they organized this council for the republic when we don't have a republic. How can you understand, if we were a republic, how can you have the people that declare republic are in Catalan prisons? So, what's going on here? Why were they not set free in minute one? Because Spain and Catalan government are the same team and they work together. And as hard as it may seem, that is the case. And now every Catalan politician has to, we want a referendum for independence. They want to do another one. Imagine the situation in Scotland. In Scotland, you want independence, but they changed the, the ballot boxes, you know, with the IVOX and, and everything, all the shenanigans, you know. But imagine that in Scotland, you had won the referendum. And you had Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmon telling you that you need to do another referendum. You would consider them traitors, no? And you would be right to do so, <laughs> and they are. So Catalan leaders are ignoring the referendum we already won and asking for another referendum. Why? Because they work for Spain. And as they work for Spain, Spain has to protect the traitors by pretending to attack them. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult when somebody has been telling you for 74 programs, lots of interviews and conferences. It's not that difficult. But this cognitive dissonance is blocking millions of Catalans from learning this. But we are changing things. We are not going to do any more referendums that would be rigged for Catalonia to lose them. From one rigged referendum to another, this weekend, the French colony of New Caledonia, which has been French since 1853, in Melanesia, in Oceania, is holding a referendum for independence that the polls say, surprise, surprise, it's going to be lost by independence. It's the Canucks, where had a strong leadership in 1988. A group of pro-independence people kidnapped uh, some 20 policemen. But then there was a massacre where 16 people were killed in liberating them, but some of the people were executed, not in the action itself, but in the ambulances. That brought about negotiations, tension, whatever, and they decided to agree on a referendum for 1998. 
10 years later. That shows the importance of time. In Catalonia, they've been delaying things for 10 years to make pro indie movement go down. They have done the same protocol in New Caledonia. In Scotland, they did the contrary. When independence is going up, they put the Scottish independence referendum before the Brexit. Because if it had, the Brexit had been before, the Brexit situation would have made a lot more people to vote for independence of Scotland, so they couldn't have rigged it so easily as they did. So they juggle things and they play with us and with our emotions and with everything the way they want. And they call it democracy. But that's not bad enough. It happens that in 1988, for signing the agreement, the leader of the Canucks was murdered, apparently by one of his own kind. But it happens, which happens to be the same thing as it happened with Gandhi, we already mentioned. And as far as I know, with Michael Collins as well. So these things of being killed by your own side begin to be a bit suspicious, isn't it? But it wasn't enough, so they postponed it for 20 years more. Now they're doing a referendum 30 years after the heyday of Kanak independence. And that's how they murder independence, by postponing things. They've do it, done it everywhere in Scotland. In, in Scotland, they brought it forward. In Catalonia, they're postponing it till violence and other things will make it impossible to win. And on top of that, Macron has been there and has proposed a free state associated, free associated state, which is the same thing that Artur Mas proposed to Catalonia. And the same thing that goes on in Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, where they happen to not want to be a free associated state. They prefer independence or being a normal state of the United States. So that's how they cheat nations by putting referendums we can never win, like in Greece, like in Ireland, about the Treaty of Lisbon, like in Catalonia, like in Scotland, everywhere. Referendums kill independence. So if you want a referendum, you don't want independence. We're going to a different continent, though it will land in Catalonia as well. Last week, in the chapter that we were not able to do in English, but we're talking about 500 people, 500 children stolen in Argentina from 1976 to 1983 in the military dictatorship by Viola, Videla, etc. And this interest in those peculiar years in Argentina brought attention to the case of Mario Firmenich, Mario Firmenich, leader of Montoneros guerrilla. That he committed several murders, but the most interesting, if you can call it interesting, is the fact that a lot of evidence shows that he was an infiltrator, infiltrated by the military regime. He is supposed to have met Macera, one of the top three in the military dictatorship in Paris. Thing is so evident that even uh, uh, I'm not an ambassador, but a diplomatic person in Paris was called in to Argentina and she was murdered. And the main line is that she was murdered because she knew about this very relevant secret. Mario Firmenich, leader of the Montoneros guerrilla, meeting with the dictatorship. But we know that his wife was briefly imprisoned by the military and 24 hours later she was set free when she was pregnant. We explained last week that pregnant women that fell in the hands of military that time, they were murdered, tortured, murdered, and the children were stolen. But it happens that the wife of the top Guerrilla man is set free in 24 hours. Well, if that's not infiltration, tell me what it is. But that's not all. There was also a couple of relevant murders of uh, Father Mujica and of uh, a top treatment person called Ruchi. Of both of them, he's suspicious of having set his criminal band on top of that. And there's the theory of the two demons. Because 
the actions of the guerrilla, as it has happened in lots of other ways, as you know, we know that the IRA was infiltrated, we know that ETA was run by Spain. We know that they're trying to bring about violence in Catalonia to have an excuse for oppression and to bring independentism down. Well, but not only that, but in 1979-1980, this Mario Firmenich organized the coming back of about 200 guerrilla members that were exiled and they were hunted like rabbits by the military junta. So he set his own side up. And after that, he decided to study economics in Buenos Aires and then he ran away to Catalonia, where he lives now in Villanova la Jutru. First, he was in a department where the leader of the ANSC and some other relevant people happened to belong to that same department, which is peculiar. Another peculiar thing is Joseph Stiglitz, the then vice president of the World Bank and later on a Nobel Prize winner in economics, happened to be his tutor in his doctoral thesis. Peculiar because, sorry, I jumped an important part. He was sentenced to 30 years, but then Carlos Menem signed a pardon after only five years. He was set free and then he ran away to Catalonia. And uh, not only that, by 2003, an international searching or warrant was issued so he could explain what happened with these 200 people that were murdered or set up. But then they claimed that it had prescribed, it had, it was too late. It's a bit scary, but it, it again shows how both sides work together. Both sides work together everywhere in the world and they protect one another. This gorilla also organized something out of a slapstick, trying to um, trying to sabotage one ship in Gibraltar or something during the Falkland Islands. And this Falkland Islands, also this guerrilla was supporting what the military junta was doing. So both sides work together on top. And then again, people get murdered in IRA, in ETA, in Brigade Rose, because they don't know that these armies, and the same thing happens today with Gladio 1, Gladio B. People join Islamic State or Al-Qaeda or you name it because they don't know that Al-Qaeda and Islamic State is the enemy they think they're fighting against. They're fighting for the enemy they think they're fighting against. Sad as it is. And this guy nowadays is... Uh, his son is a advisor of Podemos, the fake anti-system party that is CIA-run. And this guy lives happily, and I know I'm putting uh, some more pressure on my life by doing this. But then it wouldn't be us, is it? Our conscience doesn't let us that a guy called Mario Eduardo Firmenich is a university professor in Catalonia when what he is is a murder that was pardoned by the dark side of things. Otherwise, he would still be in prison. Not still. He would be possibly coming out now. Anyways, if something happens to me, go to Baleares Street in Villanueva la Geltrú and start asking Mario Eduardo Firmenich if he knows something about it. Possibly he'll say that you have no right to do that. He might even challenge you to a duel, as he's known to have done to journalists. But I don't think he likes duels, really, because he likes more shooting you in the back. It's more his style. Anyways, to finish this uh, chapter, we are following this line of trying to bring about issues related to child abuse. And the use of children in, um, in wars is one of the worst things. It's difficult because children are suffering so many things in this world. War affects children already because their parents die, because they're shorter of food. Um, scared and traumatic, always war, but when you're a child, it's worse. But children are used not only as soldiers, which is the main and the worst one, but also as couriers or informers and also as propaganda tools. We know when these fake chemical attacks blamed on uh, 
Syria or other enemies of Western countries. Children, we've seen children being actors and saying that they've been part of chemical attacks and then it's been known they were actors or even they were killed by the opposite side that is portrayed. There's an additional protocol in some United Nations agreement which has been signed by 196 countries, but there's 46 countries still in where child soldiers are being used. It happened already in First and Second World War. It also happened in the um, Spanish Civil War where the, the, um, a very young levy of 15-year-old children were brought in to the Republican side. The Republican here was the left uh, communist anarchist side, nothing to do with the Republicans in the United States. And uh, but 46 countries still use children soldiers. It's estimated there's 300,000 children soldiers in the world, and uh, we need to put a stop to this. Mainly happens in Africa, but also in Asia, and as far as I know, in Colombia, it happens as well. But then again, as it happened with other things, I was watching today how five million people are about to starve in Yemen. And then you might say, yeah, it's Arabia doing it, maybe, and it's true. But they do it with weapons sold by Western countries. So then again, it's, it's not, you see the map and you don't see children soldiers in, you know, the usual places, Australia, Northern America, and Europe. You don't see children soldiers there. And you kind of see them in Colombia and some African countries and some, Asian countries, but then you think that where are the weapons sold for these things to happen? And then all these happy, nice uh, white countries in Northern Europe, Northern America, and Australia come to mind, isn't it? There's horrible stories, and again, I learned about this and so many other things by Delia Forrest, which is. Um, very relevant in this program and it's very relevant in everything I do. So um, if this program reaches you, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Again, we're working against the clock to make Catalonia independent. I hope that we can establish relationship with the Scottish uh, resistance soon because we're forging this alliance with Basque country and we need people everywhere in the world to fight for all the just causes. We are winning in Catalonia. We're going to win. Saura Luba Gubra Visca Catalunya Lliura. This has been another update from the Catalan Independentist Resistance from Radio Hadrian. Remember that you can follow us on social media, either on Facebook, YouTube, our Twitter account, Instagram, Google, Telegram, and also on eBooks.